Uh, good evening, fellowship. It's, uh, it's such a privilege for us to worship our God and, and sing in song, sing His word, pray His word. Now we get to preach His word, His infallible word, and we continue in worship, even in the preaching of His word. Much more to even an AI extent, because this is His word, this, these words are infallible. This is, these are the words of Christ, our God. And so, we will continue now in worship as we make display of our, our God and His greatness. You know, driving here, saw the lightning, and it was, it was an amazing sight, but also very scary. And that's, that's, that's something that's created. Imagine the God who has created that. And so, join me now as we make much of our God. I want you to focus on His Word, because this Word is alive, and active, and true. Let's uh, open in a word of prayer. Our Father, we come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, by believing, who leads and guides us into all truth and tells us of things to come. And now, dear Holy Spirit, I, I place my weak hands in your strong hands, and I, I thank you that these words are your words. We thank you, Lord, that as we go through this very text this evening, this will bring much enlightenment to God, to the people that are here, these souls that are here, that that they will become more and more and more like your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us, O oh God, to, to cherish this very word that we have in order to grow in Christ daily. That we may grow to be more and more like him in our walk, in our walk of sanctification, until we run this race and complete it with joy in our hearts. In a beautiful day when we shall see our Savior, Jesus Christ, face to face. We thank you, Lord. We honor you. May you be glorified now in preaching of your word. May you be put on display and may your true beauty shine out in this place tonight. I thank you, my God, that these words are your words, not mine. And so I submit myself to the authority of this, your word. May you be glorified now, for we ask this mercy in your son's name, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The darkness in this world shows us our need for the light. The, the fall of the first Adam who brought death through sin into the world shows us our need for the second Adam, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who saved us from the second death, providing us with eternal life. And we clearly can see all this in the 21st century because we've got the full canon. We've got God's word. We totally understand it, especially in reform circles when we're speaking of God's word week after week. But... Just imagine for a moment that you were there in the very beginning. I want to set the stage here. Just, just for a moment, just imagine that you were the one in the very beginning and you were omnipotent, completely sovereign over everything that will ever take place. You get to write your entire story, which is going to be in time, which eventually will become the story of all creation, of everything that will ever exist. You will be in control of everything that will ever take place. You are the, the supreme being over everything that exists. I want to know how will you write your story. Remember that, you know, you, you can do what you want, with whom you want, whenever you want, irrespective of how you want to do it. And possessing this kind of power, you will have an endless list of possibilities. And from this monumental list of enormous future endeavors, would one of them in that list be to offer your life as a sacrifice? Just one of them. Would it be? And besides that, the people who actually want this life from you, hate you. They, they are at enmity with you. Just think about it. There's, there's many ways you could play out your own story. What would you do? With a, with a twitch of your finger, you could destroy this entire race, this, this entire race of wicked, depraved people. Will you do that, or will you choose to rather die for them? Well, the true author of the story we are now living out in reality chose to die for us to die for me, chose to die for you. God in his sovereignty and power chose to die for us, us weak, wretched creatures of sin. The big question we want to ask tonight is, why? The title of the sermon for today is The Greatest Love of All Time. And our text for today is from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. And I will, we will go through an outline as form as such, which it will be three points. The first point, perfect timing for the perfect sacrifice. 
That would be verses 6 and 7. And there we want to ask the question, what did Christ do for us? Next, the next point, God saved us from himself. Verses 8. There we want to ask, why did Christ do this for us? And point number 3, the reconciled boast in their God. Verses 9 to 11. And there we want to ask, what have we received as a result of what Christ has actually done for us? Now, firstly, some background. we in the book of Romans. So the literary genre, meaning the category, the genre of this book is under epistles, and it's, which is a, simply it's a letter that Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote. He's, he's writing this to the members of the church in Rome, and Rome at the time, is, this is the capital of the Roman Empire. That's where he's writing to. And, and Paul wrote this epistle from Corinth. And this was during his, towards the close of his third missionary journey, around AD 56, as he prepared to leave for Palestine with an offering for the poor believers in the Jerusalem church. That's, that's a setting. And in Paul's day, this, this city had roughly around a million people, many of which were slaves. And, and if you look at this epistle compared to like uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, uh, Galatians, there Paul was actually correcting aberrant theology. He was, he was um, so upset with ungodly living that he was rebuking that. And, and that's what was happening in those epistles. But specifically in the book of Romans, the people that he was writing to, the church, the Roman church, who were the recipients of this letter, they were doctrinally sound. But all churches, as we know, need sound doctrine, still require practical instruction, and, and the letter in this book of Romans is just that. If you can, please open with me to the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. Amen. I'm going to read God's word for us tonight. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life. Not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Man, we thank God for his word. Point number one, perfect timing for the perfect sacrifice, if you're taking notes. And here we want to ask the question, what did Christ do for us? Verse 6 says, for, while, let's just stop there, for. That word for is a subordinating conjunction. It's a conjunction that's joining the preceding text, which is verse 5. And then it's continuing. So let's see what verse 5 says. Verse 5 says, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given us. Then he continues with for a while and he continues with the rest of verse 6. So the reason that word for is there to join the preceding text, and the preceding text is telling us that God's love is poured out into our hearts. And Paul wants to answer the question, okay, well, how? How is God's love poured out into our hearts? How can we prove that, that this God truly loves us? Um, what can we see to, to, to show us that he truly loves us? And that's what, that's what this word for is. Let's continue. For, while we, we is the first person pronoun, which means it's indicating that Paul is writing to his readers. Um, he's writing to himself as well. This, this refers to himself as well. But more and above that, it refers to us today as believers in Christ. Because we are actually in this text that we see today. And, and it, then it goes on to say, for... While we were, were is in the present tense, indicating whatever is to follow now was our continual state. That was a continual state of our souls. And there's it, the word helpless. That's what we were. We were helpless. That's quite self-explanatory. The Greek word is a, in, in the Greek in a, is a compound word, and it actually means without strength or bodily vigor. That's what that word means. And in context, it, it actually means you are incapable of working out any righteousness for yourself in context of this text. Basically, you're spiritually dead, unable to do anything. And the same Greek word, helpless, can be also found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 14, where it says, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. That's the very same word that's used there. This, this, this means physically weak, and figuratively, in context, it actually means spiritual weakness, a weak conscience. A, a weak religious system, and therefore rendering you powerless to do anything. That's what 
That's what that word means. So I want you to, to think about this for a moment. We haven't even gone any further in this text. We, are just, we just started it off. And already you can see how powerless we were regarding any righteousness for our own self, let alone choosing Christ as our Lord. That's what we see so far. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, this in, in English is actually called dative of time. Dative, which means it represents a point or a position. And in this case, it's representing a point or position in time. And the Greek word kairos means in due season. It's an appointed time. It's a specific time. There's, you, you know, there's the sacrificial atoning sacrifice of God's only son was, was not just an afterthought. It was something that God planned. He, he planned this thing way in the beginning, in eternity past, on how he will deal with the sins of mankind. This is not something that's by the way. Therefore, this prepositional phrase is there, at the right time. And that, that's a time when God chose to accomplish this. So when was the right time, if we had to think about this? Well, according to the text and according to commentator Pastor John MacArthur, this was the right time for God, when we were powerless to escape our sin, when we were spiritually dead and had no power to escape it, when we were powerless to resist Satan, when we were powerless to please our God in any way, that according to God was the right time, and that's when he sent his only son. This according to God was the perfect time. Let's continue with the text. It says, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now bringing this verse to a close, remember in the beginning we looked at that word for, and we want to know, okay, Paul needs to answer the question, how is God's love being proved? How is God's love being shown? and will pour out into our hearts. And Paul answers it right here at the end of this verse. The death of Christ. Christ died for you. Christ died for me. He gave his life for us. And this, and this word died is actually used quite frequently by Paul in this literary unit, meaning in this, in this passage of scripture. And it literally means to die off. And, and died here is in the aorist tense in, in Greek, there are many different tenses, as opposed to what we have in English, which is past, present, future. And Aorus basically is a snapshot of something that took place, something that's objective, something that's unchanging, no matter what you do. It's, a, it's, it's, it's done, and that's what this means, and died. Died is actually in that tense when, when Paul was, was writing this. It's a completed action on the cross, thus indicating it's historical, and it's fixed, and it's objective. And then what does it say at the end? Christ died for the... Does it say uh, for, the, for the righteous? Does the scripture say for the, for the good? Does the scripture say did Christ die for those who worship the Father in spirit and truth? And in, this, in the time that we were in, when this was written, specifically talking of the date of time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for wicked, depraved men and women who have no fear for God, no reverence, no respect for the things of God. These people were totally irreligious. They, they were... They were, they were walking in a total opposite direction of what God wanted them to walk in. And, and theologians describe this as total depravity. Meaning, you, every ounce of you is evil. There's, there's nothing in you. Your words, your actions, your deeds, your thoughts, everything about you, even the very minute part of you, is totally evil and wicked. And that's who Christ died for. And it's important for us to know that the implication of this text, because of the word we, that, that personal pronoun that we saw, shows that you and I were these people. You and I were wicked, irreverent, depraved people. And we see once again, God's love is actually protruding here. God's love is showing forth here. Christ died for wicked men and women who were unable to save themselves. And from this verse, we see God proved his love while we were still helpless at the right time for the ungodly. That's what we see in this verse specifically. And God's love for us is unwavering because it's got nothing to do with our own love. It's got to do more in fact, with his, the consistency of his very own character. And that's our God. He came at the time when you and I were most undesirable. That's the time God chose to come, when we were his enemy. And that's the right time. That was the right time for God. And God works like this. Matthew 5, verse 46 says, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And Christ lived out this very text. In form of application for us today in fellowship, I encourage you that this verse alone already proves that we had nothing to do with our salvation or being righteous in any way. There's, there's nothing that we can do to earn this. 
And we didn't know about this when it was happening. So stop thinking in this way. Uh, the price was paid, the work was done by our Lord Jesus Christ. It is finished. Let's move on to verse number 7. Verse number 7 says, For one would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the, for the good man, someone would even dare to die. That word for there now is working from the preceding text. It, it heightens and illustrates God's love for sinners. That's what's happening here. And that's, therefore Paul is starting with that again. And Paul, Paul actually states that even idol-worshipping Greeks may, may actually lay down their lives for a heroic person or patriot may actually do that, even though it's not common practice. And the Jews, on the other hand, will never esteem this as a common practice. They will never want to do something like that, lay down their life for, even if it was a righteous man or a good man. So you can see how slim the chances are for someone to lay down their life for someone who is good, someone who is righteous. Now imagine what it would be for them to lay down their life for someone who is wicked, someone who is who's, uh, evil in, in every intention. And yet this is what God has done for us. You know, one will, one will actually pay ransom for, a wife will pay ransom to get a husband out from prison because she loves her husband. Will that same wife pay bail or ransom to go and get the murderer who murdered her husband out from prison? Will they, would she do that? Her husband was murdered, a murderer is put into jail. Will she do the very same thing she did for her husband? Go right there, pay bail, and get this man out so he can walk the streets. Will we do that in our human thinking? Let's use logic. Or will a man will actually choose to get into a child trafficking hotspot to save as many children as he can so they do not get sold into sex slavery. And that man will make peace with it that he would actually risk his life and even if he dies, he dies a hero. A man can actually do that. But can, the, can that very same man give his life for the child trafficker himself? For the child trafficker who has just sent 100 children down to Vietnam to be sex slaves. Will, will a man then give his life for that? I want to actually maybe point a question to you that's here tonight. If you had a child and your child was actually kidnapped, your child was taken away from you, and you are frantically looking for your child, and, and after two weeks you find your child, and you find the man who actually kidnapped your child, and this man is about to send your child to Vietnam. And your child is actually about to be shipped. And you actually, she sees you and she runs to you. And you, you save your child. What would you do in that moment? How would you think in that moment? Regarding this man. Regarding his state. What, what, would, what would be going through your mind in that very moment that you found this man? Who was about to sell your daughter for sex slavery. And... That's a picture I want to paint to you, that, that this is the kind of people God died for. That's what Paul is trying to say us here. Is this is the kind of depraved, wicked thinking people Christ laid his life down for. So, yes, justice will be served and justice will be served perfectly. But my argument is not about justice here. My argument is about comparing the love of God to the love of man. That's what Paul is looking at in this text. God chose to die for wicked people. And I reiterate, the we in that first verse means us. We are included in this. Point number two, God saved us from himself. Verses eight, we're going to look at. And there we're going to ask the question, why did Christ do this for us? Okay, verse eight says, but God. Ah, we love that. We, we just love that line. I, I love that line. I know our pastor Kelly loves this the statement, but God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But God, it gives me such peace. It gives me such joy to know that we've got a God who's there, who's there to rescue his people. And immediately here, Paul is contrasting the love of man from the preceding text, what we just discussed. He's comparing that love to God's love. Therefore, but God. And this is a huge contrast because God does not love like man loves. God is laying down his life for his enemies. This, this contrast, but God, is profound and is found throughout Scripture. I mean, it's, it's where God's hand sovereignly gets into the affairs of man. So that his perfect will is done. And he does it at precisely the right time. Mr. R.C. Sproul describes this as the doctrine of concurrence. 
at precisely the right time. Let's look at, look at Genesis 50 verses 20 where uh, Joseph is, on account of his brothers, is, is telling them, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Let's look at the book of Psalm 73 verses 26, a psalm of Asaph. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Acts 13 verses 29 to 30. When they carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in the tomb. But God raised him from the dead. There are so many accounts of but God found in the scriptures, and just like in our text today, but God demonstrates his own love toward us. Now this word demonstrates is, is actually showing a point of, uh, of showing, proving, establishing. That's what it means. So God gives proof of his great love for sinners. Know the, the verb tense in this, demonstrates. It's actually in the present tense. But at the end of that verse, Paul ends with a clause which says Christ died for us. That word died is in the aorist tense, which means it's something that objectively happens. So why would Paul use demonstrates? It would be natu more natural for Paul to have written it, and God demonstrated his love toward us, and his own love toward us. Well, Paul puts that in the present tense, showing that God's love for us was not just a completed event in the past. Now, God loves you then, God loves you now. God will continually love you. This is God continually demonstrates his own love toward us. This is the greatest love of all time. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. Notice he just, he didn't say just his love, but he says his own love. And the, the verbs died, die, and reconcile, which is still to come. All of this is because God demonstrates his love his, and his own love towards us. There's, a, there's an extra emphasis in there, his own love. Is is the personal pronoun and it's connected to the proper pronoun with God in this text. And we've got something called the genitive opposition, which means possession, which means it indicates who possesses an object, who, who owns this love, whose love is it, that's what it means. And in this text, this is God's own love, belongs to him. So when we look at the cross, we can see that the text represents God's own love. Why didn't the text say Christ's love or Jesus' love? And Jesus was the one who was placed upon the cross. It would also be true, he said, if it was Christ's love instead of God's own love. Well, the word puts emphasis on own, and it puts emphasis on God the Father. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 10, it says, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So does this mean now that we separate the love of Christ and the love of God? No, by no means. Because Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. And so because Christ is one with God, Paul can actually speak in this way. Paul can actually show that a demonstration of God's own love on the cross. Therefore, he can describe it in that way. And the word love there in the Greek is agape, which actually means sacrificial love. It means it's, it's an unconditional love. God doesn't love like man loves. And love is also one of God's attributes, which we've recently learned in our studies together in Bible studies. We know that any attribute of God is not what it does, but it's who he is. And God is love. As our brother Clint shared in his, in his message, it's the love of God is, it's who he is. And can you, can you imagine, even though at the time when we were in darkness, we were wretched sinners, God totally loved us. He totally loved us then, he totally loves us now, and he will totally love us in the future to come. This kind of love will take us, a, take us a lifetime to understand and comprehend. It will also take us an eternity to comprehend and understand. I reiterate again, the greatest love of all time. God loves you. God loves you. God loves me. And God loves you. Just need to reiterate that for us. In John 15, 13, he says, Greater love has no one than this, than one who laid down his life for his friends. I pray that the certainty of God's love will change your perspective in all aspects of your life. May man loves naturally. Man will love those who love himself, uh, who loves him back. God loves supernaturally. God does not love in this way. God's, God's love supersedes human logic, human thinking. His love is not dependent on how good you are. His love is not dependent on whether you love him back. God loves you. 
The scripture continues to say, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That word were is in the present tense, which indicates our entire life, our thoughts, our deeds. Everything was categorized by sin. That's what it means. And it ends up with were yet sinners. Sinners are always in the opposite direction of God's perfect will. The view of the Pharisees, that they are the view of the, the Jews, the Pharisees' view of sin when they looked at the Jews uh, partaking in, in ceremonial duties uh, incorrectly. Like, for example, Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ sat with tax collectors and, and sinners and dined with them, they were unhappy about this. Matthew 9, verses 11. And the Jews called the Gentiles sinners, and, and they considered them heathens. But Jesus' whole purpose for coming into the world was for sinners. That's what we have to understand. That's who he came for. Matthew 9, 13 says, For I do not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Once again, the greatest love of all time. And point number three, we go on to the reconciled boast in their God. And we're going to look there at verses 9 to 11. And we want to ask the question there, what have we received as a result of what Christ has done for us? Verses 9 says, Much more than... Have we now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. This is the much more argument, and it's repeated four times in the book of Romans. Actually, two times in this literary unit, verses 9, verses 10. So there's, there has to be a reason for this repetition. And Paul, well, yeah, he just wants to compare something. He wants to compare the greater thing to the lesser thing. It goes, this argument goes like this. If, if God has done the greater thing, then certainly how much more will God do the lesser thing? And so that's what Paul wants to show us here. So let's read on to see what two things Paul is actually comparing. He says, much more than having now been justified. Wow, justified. That's a big word for us. Justification. It's a big word for us, especially in the reform circles. God making righteous, guilty, condemned sinners. It's guilty, condemned sinners, wretched sinners. God justifying them, making them righteous. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And justification is actually the overarching theme of the book of Romans. And you can see that God put this plan of justification in place way before you and I were a twinkle in our mother's eye. So this happened a long time ago. It's another reminder of how powerless we truly are when it comes to any form of righteousness or, or any form of salvation. We weren't there. This is something that God had planned in eternity past. And from here, this opens up into the central theme. The, so the, the book of Romans has a theme of justification. And from there, at a micro level, it stems up to a macro level over the entire Bible. And the theme of the, the Bible is man's need to be reconciled back to his God. And this is, this is God redeeming a people by his son, for his son, for his own glory. And that's what we see happening in here. Justification. Much more than have we now been justified by his blood. That word blood there is an Old Testament imagery of sacrifice. It's taking us back now. This, this word alludes to what used to happen in the Levitical system. We know that blood is a basic component of life. Life is in the blood. The shedding of Christ's blood was a penalty price that was paid for our sins. This, this word, this is actually a foreshadow of the Levitical system. But it became the realization of substance when Jesus Christ died upon the cross. You see that what happened in the Old Testament is just a foreshadow of the real deal of the real thing. Now, what happened back then was just atonement of, of us trying to cover sin. What happened with Jesus Christ was the real deal. And this was the ultimate sacrifice, the only sacrifice, the last sacrifice. There will never ever be another one. And this is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that word, by his blood, not only, not only shows that this is an Old Testament imagery, but it also shows that Christ had a violent death. This, this death was gruesome. His death was gruesome, man. I want you to picture that. And this, this, is, this is the love God has for us. He suffered in our place. Bringing out the theological term we know as, as penal substitution, which means Christ actually died in the place and was punished in the place of sinners. Christ suffered in his death for you and for me. He was a substitution in our place to face the full wrath of God. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Christ bore the full fury of God's wrath. And we heard that word recently earlier, uh, propitiation. It means, 
It means Christ was the appeasement of God's wrath. He was the full satisfaction of God's wrath. And that, that word is a noun. It's not a verb. Propitiation. It's God, Christ, Jesus Christ being the propitiation for sin. We're so thankful for Christ, for what he's done. And because of this, there is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. And we ask the question, what did Christ truly save us from? Well, from this text, we can see that he saved us from the wrath of God that's coming. The wrath of God is coming to everyone except for those who are in Christ Jesus. But what we see in this text, yeah, we see that Christ saved us from the wrath of God. We see two persons. In systematic theology, under theolog theology proper, we have a subheading called the Trinity, which shows three persons in the Godhead. And right here in this very text, we see two persons already. We see God the Father where the wrath is actually coming from, and we see Jesus Christ appeasing that wrath in place of sinners. So we see two persons in the Godhead. So we know what God saved us from, but can we change the question around? Can we ask, who did God save us from? And there we can see very clearly that, that God saved us from himself. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 10 says, and, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. It could only be God who could save us from himself. No man could bear the sins of mankind. You don't have the ability to do that. God is the epitome of purity and holiness. And the sacrifice had to be exactly in that way. The candidate for the sacrifice had to be deity. Thus proving our Lord Jesus Christ is truly man, truly God. He is. Now let's look at this statement in, in full circle, this entire verse so that we can look at this much more argument that Paul brought in the beginning. He says, much more then, have we now been justified by his blood, we, have been, we shall be saved from the wrath of God. And to remind you, this form of argument shows if God has done the greater thing, certainly he will surely do the lesser thing. Now, to give you an illustration, a father buys a plot of land for his son, and his son, he knows his son in detail, he knows exactly what his son loves, so he he bought this plot of land and he built the son his ma this mansion, this beautiful mansion, five-bedroom mansion, <clears throat> overlooking the Dolphin Coast. And he knows that his son loves surfing, and more especially his son loves nature, and <clears throat> his son loves God's creation. He his son would love to wake up in the morning and just look at the sunrise that's uh, beaming through. And, uh, and his son loves surfing. He, kn he knows all of these details about his son, and so he buys this house for his son. He gives him the key and says, son, this is yours. Take it. And his son is so excited, he actually uh, takes this keys, he opens up his house, and he goes in and he says, wow, everything is perfect. This is, this is exactly what I wanted. My, my, my dad knows me so well. And he goes into this one room, and he opens up the curtain, and he doesn't open up the curtain, he just presses a button. The curtain opens up. And he, and he looks out at this ocean, and this beautiful view, whether it's raining or windy or sunshine, this is just, he cannot understand that he could sit in a room and actually look at something like this. So now at this point in, the, in his story, would you think the son would actually ask his father permission to, to have this room? You, do you think his father would condone him this room or say, no, no, you're not allowed to, to use that room? <clears throat> Doesn't make sense, right? Because his father's already given him the entire house. His father's given him this entire house. All, all five bedrooms is yours. What, what for ask me permission for just one room? You're just asking me for 8% of what I've given you. And that's what Paul is trying to describe here, this much more argument. But the, the difference is that, that illustration that I gave you pales in comparison to what Paul is describing in here. What Paul is describing is that God has already demonstrated his own love towards us by dying for us. Sure. There, is, there, there cannot be a greater love than this. Can there be a greater love than, than someone actually dying for you? Can you picture that? They can give you all the money in the world. They can give you access to all their bank accounts. They can give you the house, the car. But will it ever trump someone coming towards you and saying, I, I want to give my life for you? Uh, that, there could never be something greater than that. John 15, 13. So Christ giving his life for you becomes the greater in this argument. And then the wrath of God that's coming becomes the lesser. I hope you guys understand that. I see that that's what Paul was meaning there. He says, if, if God, if Christ has given you his life, what, what more than for you to be saved from the wrath of God that's coming your way? Because, because what you have is something greater. And that's what Paul was illustrating here. So the takeaway point is, trust in the love of God. Trust in the love of your God. Is, 
This is the greatest love of all time. Verses 10, let's go to verse 10. It says, for if we were, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, there's another much more argument, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The main verb in this text is reconciled, and as we know in English, the verb directs the, the flow of the sentence. In this case, reconciled is the main verb. And that word there describes actually an exchange of coins for, for others of equal value. So in context of this, of this text, it means you're exchanging a relationship of hostility with a relationship of love. That's what it means. We, we, we exchange in a relationship of enmity, where we are enemies, now, now becoming friendly and friends, having friendship. And God provided us reconciliation through the death of his son. That's how this was provided. And the latter part of this verse says, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Similarly, the much more argument is used once again. Think about it. If God has to, had to come and save you and reconcile you when you were his enemy, when you were his enemy, how much more now that post-reconciliation? Post you, you were his enemy, he reconciled you, adopted you into his family, now you are within the family of God, how much more will you be saved by his life? And that's what it means. That's how it's been described here. So I encourage you to acknowledge that this reconciliation was, was through the death of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus on the cross, was not just words. Don't just read this as words. Acknowledge it for your life personally. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge it for your personal, eternal state. Verse 11 says, and, and not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Exalt there means, uh, it's actually in the present tense, and it actually means feel joy or great delight or joyful confidence. And Paul wrote it in the present tense so that you could continue in this boasting. It's, it actually means a boasting over a privilege or possession. You, you possess something and now you boast in it. That's what that means. And because it's in the present tense, it means a Christian's life should be continuous like this. This is, this is how we live. This is who we boast in. We boast in our God. We boast in what our God has done for us. And not only this, but we exalt in God. Notice that in God, that's actually called locative of sphere, meaning our boasting is confined within the bounds of the sphere of God. That's what it means. It's, it's looking at a location. For example, Romans 3 verses 24 says, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. That's where the location is. And so what we call this is locative of sphere, in God. We, we also exalt in God. And towards the latter part of that verse, it says, through whom we have now received. The, the word received there is actually in the aorist tense again, which conveys something that's actually done already, objective, unchanging. And careful to note there, church, reconciliation is not something you do, but it's something you receive. It's, it's not something you accomplish, it's something you embrace. It's, there's nothing that you need to do for that. And that word reconciliation, just like the word blood we looked at, it alludes back to an Old Testament imagery. And that word there alludes back to the word atonement. And back then in the Old Testament, there would just be atonement and covering of, of sin. But they, they all knew that this points towards the cross. This points towards the true Lamb of God who will one day take away the sins of the world. I want you for a moment just to imagine with me, you know, with your imagination, that, that day when John actually looked at Jesus Christ walking toward him. I wonder what that, the weather must have been like, and I wonder what he, what he experienced when he saw that. And this is regarding the testimony of Jesus Christ in John chapter 1. And he wrote these words. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I encourage you to boast in your God, not on your own faithfulness, but on his finished work on the cross. For the, for the believer, this means it is done. And the assurance of your salvation cannot be based on what you feel. It actually has to be based on what Christ has done. Conclusion today, we're going to we're gonna wrap it up as to what have we learned today. We, well, we, the literary unit we went through had a thrust of God's love for sinners. We've seen that throughout. The greatest love of all time. The main verbs died, die, reconciled. All of this was done because God demonstrated his love toward us, his own love toward us. The passage seems to be have broken up into three parts, in three sections from our observation. 
which was, what did Christ do for us? And, he, and the answer to that is, he died for us when we were powerless to do anything for ourselves regarding righteousness. Why did Christ do this for us? Because he loves us. And God demonstrates his own love to us while we were helpless at the right time for the ungodly. What have we received as a result of what Christ has done? We have received justification. We received the salvation we have. We have received reconciliation and exalting or boasting in this truth should be a continuous walk for the believer of Christ. Uh, from observation in this text as well, I see that verses 8, if you look at verse 8, it's actually sandwiched in between verses 6 and 7, which is speaking of the death of Christ, and verses 9, 10, 11, which is actually speaking of what we've received, the reconciliation. So God's love here becomes the heart of this literary unit. This, this passage is driven by God's love for his people. God loves you, I want to encourage you with that. Don't ever doubt that. Don't allow the trials of this life make you doubt that God loves you. Uh, don't ever allow that to ever make you think any different about the love that God has for you. I want to encourage you with that. We were not in a place of understanding when Christ died for us. Think about it. We were totally oblivious to his sacrifice. Before you, you knew this, he loved you. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says, We love because he loved us first. The greatest love of all time. If you're here tonight and you're an unbeliever, I encourage you today to repent of sin. Make Christ the Lord of your life. By doing this, you will receive the reconciliation we've spoken about in this text. It'll be yours. You receive it greatly, uh, graciously. It'll be yours. Believing Christ alone as Lord, you will not only have an assurance of your salvation, but you will actually have eternal life itself. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that it is because of what your Son, Jesus Christ, has done that we could have this eternal life that we speak of, that we could have reconciliation, that we could have justification. We thank you, Lord, by, by sending your Son that you have, you have made this specific plan in eternity past to deal with the sins of mankind. We thank you that you loved us so much, so much that you gave your one and only Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life, everlasting life. We thank you for this, Lord. We are so grateful that we have this hope in our God. We're so grateful that we have an assurance of our salvation. We're so grateful that our God loves us so much so that he, he gave his very own life for our redemption. We pray, Lord, that this be a reminder for us today that we continue to live in the gratitude and, and thankfulness of what you've done for us, our thankfulness for the cross each and every day. May we die to the self. May we die to this flesh. And may we pick up our cross and follow you all the days of our life until we see you, our Lord and Savior, face to face. But truly, God, you are the God of all gods, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. And you alone are truly to be worshipped and, and glorified. To be glorified, Lord, in, in all that we do, even for the rest of this week. Even as we, we sing now unto you as well in, in worship, that you, that you be glorified in, in every action, in every step of our lives, O oh God. For we ask all these mercies in your Son's name, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.